Hello everybody and welcome to today's vlog. Today's vlog is guided by an exceptionally kind gift from a local gentleman. He has gifted us um, four photographs and those four photographs have actually guided us towards the, another site of another plane crash out on Hatfield Moors. After my last vlog about the Wellington bomber crash site, I was actually contacted by a local gentleman who lives in Finningley. He knows the whole area like the back of his hand. And way back when, in 1959, he used to go out onto the moors and document mainly birds, but with his camera. And he still has those photographs, but this particular set of photographs is a crashed plane. These photographs are absolutely incredible and they give us a real journey back through history. Let me show you. Firstly, as we still have so many missing planes out there on the moors, where exactly was the location of this particular crash? Well, this is where things get very interesting. The gentleman who gifted me the photographs said that the plane crash that he was at where the photographs were taken was right at the side of the sandbank where Lindholm Hall sits. He also said it was within 100 yards of the old Pete railway line. This is the old railway line. Well, actually, it's the only surviving bit of railway line from when this place was the Pete Moors and prisons had it. So it went all the way down there. And then in the opposite direction, it went all the way down there, taking the peat from the peat fields to the factory. Let me show you where I am stood now using Google Earth and it will help with all the other old photographs to show the location of what we believe to be the crash site because it helps place the railway line within 100 yards of the debris field that we can see on an old photograph. So let's now look at the old photograph that we have of the moors, which clearly shows the larger circle being Lindholm Hall, the circle next to it being the unidentified plane crash, and the bottom circle is where we have the Polish memorial that we now know to be a different Wellington bomber, R1073. If you want to know the stories about those, please do check out my other videos on here or do go to my playlist, which has got all of the videos from this area, which is about RAF Lindholm and Hatfield Moors, but they are all out there for you to have a look at. So given the proximity of that top circle to both Lindholm Hall, and it being within a hundred yards of the old railway line and the gentleman at the time in 1959 knowing these moors like the back of his hand because he was an avid bird watcher and bird photographer that was out here all of the time we have to assume that this debris field and these parts of planes that he did actually photograph are of that top circle next to Lindholm Hall so now we've identified the crash site, the next question is, which plane is this? I'm still missing a Halifax bomber, at least one Wellington bomber, the crash site of W5557, if not the other one that we believe did return home to the moors as well. But we're also still missing the original crash site of the Lancaster bomber that we did in our previous video. Well, the answer to this, I went both to an incredible Facebook group I've been on for many years called Disused World War II Airfields and to my friend who is an aviation archaeologist. All of the clues that we needed really were in the photographs. 
So let's have a look at the first photograph and this is the one of the engine. The excellent knowledge of people both on the Facebook group and the um, aeroplane archaeologist were able to prove that this was in fact a Merlin engine. Now let me read you this from Google. It says the Rolls-Royce Merlin engine powered some of the most famous aeroplanes of World War II, including the Spitfire, the Hurricane, the Mosquito, the Mustang and the Lancaster. I also have to add into this list as well from knowledge that they also had these specific engines in the Halifax bombers as well. So both the Lancaster and the Halifax have this engine. So now we can rule it out being a Wellington. So on to image two, and that is the one of the gentleman stood on the wheel with the wheel connection and landing gear behind him. The first bit of evidence we have is that the fact that this wheel and some of the landing gear is there at all. What we can deduce from this picture is that had the landing gear not been down, had it still been tucked up inside the fuselage of the plane, it would also be under the peat with the rest of the plane with the fuselage. But what this picture shows us is that the wheels broke away on impact. That means it was preparing to land. Okay, so on to the third photograph. The third photograph shows the crash debris and the huge amount of land that this went over. The gentleman who took the photographs said that this crash site was absolutely huge, at least well over 100 metres. What he also said is that the fuselage of the plane had dug a massive trench out of the peat before it came to rest, and it came to rest half submerged in the peat. It was still visible, but only just. The rest of the debris field were things like the wings, the landing gear and all of the bits that could have broken off from the fuselage as it dug this channel through the peat. Another telltale factor from this particular photograph is the tree line in the background. Now back then in 1959 the peat fields were not stable, they did not hold any trees at all and the only trees at the time were actually on the sandbank next to Lindholm Hall and also down the side of the drive that actually led to Lindholm Hall itself. Out there on the rest of the moors there were no other trees. However, even with all of that information it's the very last photograph where the breakthrough happens. The very last photograph is a photograph of the plane's wing. On this photograph are the unique markings of the refuelling holes. Now we can take these, we can look at the distances between them and the size of them and we can match them to known still existing Halifax bombers and Lancaster bombers. And there we have it, absolute concrete proof. This plane is in fact a Lancaster bomber. What we also know is that only one Lancaster bomber crashed out on these moors. I've already been to that crash site. I was already given items from the plane from an older gentleman who found them many years ago. We've already proved which plane this is. We knew that there was a crash site and then we knew that the peat cutters, because it was not a war grave, moved the larger items to this other deposit site. Lancaster bomber PB857 crashed out on Hatfield Moors on the 9th of October 1945. There were no casualties. It was a training exercise when that plane came down.
So just to go back on what I've just previously said about the crash site and the deposit site being completely different, a lot of people are going to ask, well, why is that? Well, I was actually contacted by an old peat cutter a couple of weeks ago after my previous video about this particular Lancaster bomber and they told all. Basically, as they went in a straight line with the peat cutters, they rolled up the peat into similar shapes like when you get turf. What happened is that the cutters had a blade that used to slice through the peat. Any of the metal that hit these blades would just shatter. It was their job to keep these blades as pristine as possible. And the only place on the moor where they were not allowed to cut is the known war grave of the Wellington bomber that still had the crew on board. Now because of that and because they knew that there were human remains there they were not allowed to clear any of that debris field. However everything else they were allowed to and everything else that they knew about got put at this particular deposit site. So what does that mean for our missing planes? Well I've got two theories about that. The first theory is that it was war, metal was needed, they could have been salvaged. The people that needed the metal could have come out either themselves from the RAF or sent maintenance crews to be able to recover as much as possible. Or theory number two, and I know it's a romanticised theory but it's one that I hold on to, I believe the planes are still out there, either under the peat or in these huge lakes that have been left behind. All I know for 100% certainty is with every document that comes forward, with every photograph I am gifted and with every item that comes my way as well, I'm just getting that little bit closer to documenting what exactly happened out on those moors during World War II. If anybody out there is watching and you have any old photographs, I'm not asking for them to be gifted, but if I could just have copies of them. If you took photographs of plane wrecks, if you knew as a child, if you played on these moors and you knew the locations of the planes, what the planes were, whether or not they had the geodentic structure like the Wellington bombers, please do get in touch with me. I treat all information completely confidentially. And I do hope one day to fully document exactly what happened all those many years ago out here on these beautiful moors. Thank you so much for watching. I've got so many more documentaries in the pipeline. Plane crashes just keep happening all the time and just coming up. The more that we go to the National Archives, the more we learn about what happened out here as well. I've stumbled across the most beautiful story, even though it's got the most tragic ending, of what happened to one family who lost their entire young family of boys. They all went to war and not one of them came home. It's exactly the same kind of story as Saving Private Ryan, only not one of them was saved. So I hope to bring that in the next few weeks. But in the meantime, thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate every person that takes the time to view these videos and I'll hopefully see you all really soon. Take care. Bye bye.